as essentially the basic of uh, visualization. So I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, complex visualization uh, network uh, visualization or uh, advanced topic like this. Uh, what is uh, the topic of today essentially is information visualization. It has several different definitions. One of the possible definitions is the use of computer supported interactive uh, visual representation of abstract data uh, to amplify cognition. So, uh, the key elements here are uh, the visual representation aspect, that of course, uh, is part of the definition of visualization. Uh, the data, uh, this is typically the source uh, that we want to show, uh, the result of your research, for instance, and uh, eventually the, the cognition part that uh, concern uh, the ability to extract useful information uh, and get better knowledge of uh, the data that you want uh, to show. Um, as in any uh, representation of information and data, also visualization is partly uh, a sort of uh, storytelling. So you have to present your own story and you have to select the most suitable instruments uh, that are useful for uh, telling your story, your part of the truth. Uh, even in data, there is no real single truth. You have to present the data, uh, of course, in an honest way, but focusing on the points that uh, are uh, important for you. What are the elements uh, uh, in any uh, visualization? You start from the data and you have to decide how to represent the data to encode this data into visual elements. Uh, these elements uh, concern uh, the uh, low level, uh, almost physical aspects of uh, the uh, visualization. We talk about uh, visual objects and uh, properties of uh, these kind of objects. The next step uh, that this visual visualization should trigger is uh, uh, the quantitative reasoning. It is uh, the step when uh, you look at your visualization and you start to perform assessment uh, comparison uh, between different elements. This kind of uh, reasoning is the basis for what is the fully uh, and complete uh, information visualization where you typically uh, start reasoning at a higher level and you try to identify patterns, uh, you find uh, trends in your data, uh, you spot possible exceptions. This is the basis for understanding or cognition as was uh, in the definition before and understanding is the basis to take a uh, decision. Uh, in a real-world context, uh, the visualization should trigger a decision uh, whether to perform uh, some action, to uh, decide what alternative to take, uh, and so on. Uh, why visualization? Essentially, one of the main motivations behind visualization is that uh, visualization uh, increases uh, the capability of retrieval of information. Uh, in an experiment of information retrieval after uh, showing uh, some subjects uh, the same information as text alone and text plus visual information, uh, after three days uh, the ability to recall the information was around 10% for all the elements that were shown uh, when only text was uh, shown and 65% uh, when both uh, text and visual uh, visualization of the data was provided. So this is a, a strong argument in favor of using visualization and not just using uh, basic text. The second argument uh, for visualization is that uh, of density. Uh, in theory, every single pixel of an image could uh, encode a single data point, a number. Uh, so, if we take an SGA screen or a 4K screen, uh, we have uh, from 1 to 8 uh, megapixels. Uh, let's assume that we are not uh, leveraging all the 24 or 32 bits of every single pixel. Uh, let's suppose that we encode just one single character for pixel per pixel. Uh, it means that we are able to encode 8 million characters, uh, that is, uh, 
2,000 pages of written text. So the amount of information uh, that we can show is much higher using a visual representation than using a textual representation. So uh, here is an example. I will show you some example of visualization typically taken from the internet, and I will provide you uh, the link uh, at the bottom so you can uh, check. Uh, uh, some, but not all of these uh, visualizations are interactive, so you can browse on the page and then try to play with the visualization. This kind of visualization show you uh, the votes uh, cast by the um, member of the uh, USA Parliament in different years, starting from uh, uh, 49 and ending in 2011. And, uh, uh, of course, blue and red are uh, Democrats and uh, Republicans. And uh, each node represents a, a single member of the parliament. And the proximity between two nodes uh, represents uh, how many times uh, those two uh, members of the parliament vote in the same way. Uh, actually, the, the metric is a little bit more complex, but this is just the basic. Uh, so you, you can see how in the 40s uh, uh, the two uh, parties in the US were very close. Uh, if you look at, uh, here in the 70s, uh, they, they were really mixed. So you had uh, Republicans voting as Democrats and vice versa. Uh, and you start seeing in, in the 90s how these two parties and the member of the parliament of these two parties were progressively more and more uh, separate. So you have a, a very uh, strong tension between this event of these two parties, and this is probably the reason of the problems that we observe in the US politics, and not only in the US. So there are two uh, strong extremes. And this kind of visualization show you time, uh, the people, uh, and, and show you uh, in, in a very small space, half of, of the screen, how this kind of uh, uh, contraposition of these two parties uh, evolved in time. Another motivation for using uh, visualization is that it is easy uh, to uh, put information in context. Uh, in general, visualizations are uh, used to uh, let the observer compare different values uh, and put uh, the value into context. In general, uh, a single number means nothing. So if I tell you 42 and you never read uh, Doug Adams, 42 is just a number. Uh, if you have a context, if you put it into a context, then uh, the numbers start to resonate and to uh, take uh, value and meaning. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, there is no information carried by a single number. You have always to place some context, some reference uh, to let people compare. So, for instance, this is another visualization, this is from the New York Times. Uh, um, here you have uh, the, the, uh, the number of jobs, uh, 4,000 uh, people work in the middle class, and you see uh, on the horizontal axis different type of jobs. So you have a professional specialist, uh, administrative center worker, transportation <coughs> workers, skill production workers, and so on. Uh, you have uh, for each type of uh, uh, work two different uh, uh, vertical axis, one from uh, uh, 1980, the other from 2012. And you see how uh, the number of uh, uh, works, uh, of workers uh, having that kind of uh, position changed uh, in essentially uh, 30 years. So you see, for instance, uh, how uh, some uh, profession increased a lot, uh, registered nurses, uh, how other remain more or less uh, stable, uh, how other uh, decreased a lot. And uh, another information is encoded in this visualization 
is the sex or gender of uh, uh, the people holding this kind of position. So uh, we have uh, men with, with blue and women uh, with red, and you see how uh, some profession, uh, typically uh, female professions, uh, nurses, uh, some other are strongly male professions, and they remain as such, uh, a few other professions change a little bit in terms of uh, uh, the gender of the people holding the camera position. Uh, so you see here, for instance, a change from the blue uh, to a, a sort of uh, gray, that is in a 50-50 uh, division between the two genders. Um, other that starting from a male uh, change a little bit to, to a 50-50 uh, uh, division. And so you, you encode in a single graph a lot of information. So what are the bases that you can use to show uh, your data in a correct and effective way? So we have to start with uh, what is the visual perception. Uh, maybe you have seen this kind of uh, uh, diagram a lot of time, just a quick reminder. Uh, whenever you, we talk about visual perception, we have two different phases. One is the uh, physical part, the process, and the other is the perception, the most uh, cognitive part uh, of our uh, perception process. Of course, on the physical side, you have a stimulus, we have light, we have a sensory organ, and the, the cognitive part uh, essentially take place in our brain. Uh, there are several models about how our brain works. Uh, they are all wrong, uh, even the most sophisticated one. Huh? Uh, so, artificial intelligence is anything but a, a something like the human brain. Uh, one very simple model that has the huge advantage of uh, uh, letting us explain some phenomena that we observe in, in a human understanding is the one that uh, uh, divides the perception in uh, uh, processes working on three different types of memories. Uh, one is called the iconic, uh, the other is called the short term, and the third one is the, called the long term memory. Basically, the idea is that uh, uh, the first step uh, is to recognize some basic elements, uh, uh, those that are called pre-attentive attributes, and store them into uh, the iconic memory. Uh, colors, uh, uh, basic shapes, uh, and so on, are stored in the iconic memory. Uh, taking out uh, this uh, storage, uh, a, a further step in the processing, uh, store chunk of information to the short-term memory, that, uh, as the name suggests, is short term, so uh, last for, for a, a few uh, seconds or a few milliseconds, um, and is also uh, with a limited capacity. So typically, the short term memory is able to store uh, from five to nine chunks of information, concept if you, if you like, and then uh, we have uh, a, a, another step. The, in our processing that takes uh, the, the concept and the basic information chunks that are stored in the short term memory and uh, store in them into the long term memory. So, for instance, the limitation in the capacity of the short term memory uh, gives rise to the uh, 7 plus or minus 2 rule that you will know or not. No? Have you ever heard of the 7 plus or minus 2 rule? Uh, whenever you present uh, some information, a slide for instance, uh, you should provide in the same uh, screen uh, something between 5 and 9 concepts. That is the amount of concept that uh, we are able to store in our short-term memory. Whatever it is, it looks like as if in our brain we have a short-term memory. Uh, so if you provide more than nine concepts, you typically need several passes on the same uh, screen or visualization to understand what is provided. This is a, a, a human limitation, so some are 
have a, a little bit larger capacity in their short term memory, uh, some other a little bit less, but basically most of the people uh, have a capacity in that range. But before we are able to build the chunk of information in the short term memory, we need to work on the iconic memory. Uh, the iconic memory work on uh, pre attentive attributes. So, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, if I ask you to count how many files are in the screen, uh, you say, no way. But if I change the visual attributes, like this, so I change uh, the intensity and uh, the hue of the elements, now immediately uh, the task is much easier. So the basic idea underlying visualization is uh, use the pre-attentive attributes in the most effective way. So you should use this kind of attributes to drive uh, the common process of the people observing your visualization. So the idea is we have to encode our data into pre-attentive attributes. Uh, so, given a measure, a value that you want to represent, you have to select what kind of object you want to use, uh, points, lines, uh, or other shapes, uh, and what kind of visual attributes or set of visual attributes you want to use uh, for encoding that value. Uh, typically, we distinguish between two different types of uh, uh, variables, uh, the quantitative variables uh, that are typically uh, a real number, um, and the categorical variables, where you have names, categories, uh, sets. Uh, of course, some variables uh, uh, can be uh, represented easier using specific type of visual attributes. Generally, uh, when you have to um, represent a variable that has a quantitative type, you must be very careful and choose the right visual attribute that is able to represent that number in the correct way. So what are the tasks that we should support by encoding our uh, variables? Essentially, we have three main tasks uh, that we perform any time we observe visualization. Uh, the first task is uh, the discrimination. We have to tell apart the different objects that represent our data. The second is the comparison. Uh, remember, a single number means nothing, but uh, when you put two different numbers, you start doing a comparison. And also, a magnitude assessment. That is another step where you actually uh, evaluate how big that number is. Not just if it's higher or lower than another one, but uh, the real value of a number. Of course, to perform this uh, uh, task, uh, we need two uh, uh, characteristics of our visualization uh, that must uh, allow the detection of uh, elements. So we should be able to separate the elements, identify them, and distinguish different elements. And also, we have to pay attention to another characteristic of the visualization, is the separation. Uh, the farther you put the two uh, elements that you want to compare from each other, uh, the harder it will be to compare them. So typically, if you want to compare two different objects, uh, you should put them close to each other. So what are the guidelines that we can employ to design our visualization? Uh, here I will take uh, uh, a, a inspiration from uh, Edward Tufty, that is uh, a, one of the pioneers uh, in uh, visualization, and he defined three main uh, principles uh, that should guide us uh, in guaranteeing that our visualization uh, is right. These are they are called the integrity principles. So the three principles are, first of all, the proportionality. Uh, we should represent in our visualization physical quantities that are proportional to the number that we want to represent. So, if a number 
is two times another number, the two physical quantities that we are using to encode those two numbers should communicate the observer this idea one is the double of the other. Think in terms of length of a line. The two lengths should be one the double of the other if the two numbers are in that proportion. The second principle is the utility. Uh, all the graphical elements inside uh, a visualization should convey useful information. This typically rules out 90% or 99% of the visualization that you see on uh, newspaper and journals and so on, where you have a lot of decoration that convey no information at all. They distract from uh, the message. But we are trying to communicate a scientific result, uh, so we should avoid uh, eye-catching uh, visualization, and we should use uh, fair and correct visualization. The third principle is the clarity. The idea is that uh, we should use a uh, support element, a uh, level, for instance, uh, to allow a better understanding of the elements uh, and uh, to, say, uh, contra uh, counter the uh, possible alteration and deformation that we get from using a specific visualization. So, in terms of proportionality, um, uh, Taft proposed uh, one nice measure that allow us to evaluate uh, the proportionality or lack of uh, of a visualization. The measure is called life factor. So essentially, this is the ratio between uh, the size of an effect we show uh, in the graphic, so one line that is a number of times longer than another, uh, divided by uh, the effect that we have in the data. So the number represented are one n times larger than the other. Just to give you an example, I take the same uh, uh, visualization that uh, Tafti used. Here you have the um, uh, number uh, of miles per gallon that uh, a car, where the average car was, uh, were able to uh, travel in 78, 79, and 85. So. The idea is that uh, this line that represented 70, uh, 27 and a half miles per gallon, uh, divided by the length of this other red line that represents 18 miles per gallon, should be uh, the same as 27 uh, and a half divided by 18. So if we take the two lines, uh, uh, if we measure them on uh, an A4 uh, uh, paper, uh, we get 18.7 uh, uh, and 2.2 uh, centimeters. That is, on graphics, the ratio between those two uh, values is 8.5. Uh, on data, we have uh, 1.52. So, of course, uh, uh, when we compute the life factor, that is 8.5 divided by 1.52, we have 5.59. So the graph is not fair, it's lying to us, it is exaggerating the difference. So the life factor tells us how much a graph is lying to us. Uh, ideally, we should have a life factor that is one, that is no lie at all. If you wish, you can take the logarithm of the life factor and have zero means perfectly fair uh, graph. Positive values are exaggeration and negative values are uh, underestimations. Uh, concerning the utility, uh, Taupe observed that uh, every element should be useful. Uh, every element, object, uh, anything that you put in the reservation that is not <coughs> conveying useful information is distracting from the message. So, uh, 
if you put uh, some attributes, uh, colors or other, that, uh, other elements that do not convey information, they typically trigger a, a, a normal mechanism that uh, let you start thinking what does that mean. So if you have two elements with different color, uh, you start thinking that they should represent two different things. So selecting color uh, randomly, uh, putting uh, uh, cats images in the background or whatever you want, uh, are essentially elements that distract from the message. So the, the principle that Tafti was saying is that above all else show the data. Everything else is a distraction. So another measure that uh, was proposed is uh, the data ink ratio. Uh, if you take a page that is printed, uh, you count how many ink, how many pixels, if you want, are used to convey useful information, and uh, you divide that ink by the total ink that you used on your visualization. Uh, essentially, uh, this is one minus the amount of ink that you can remove from your graph without removing significant information. So in principle this should be one, all ink that you use is data ink. So, the principle should be uh, that you must maximize uh, the data integration to convey only useful information. Of course, with some grain of salt. This is an example that was uh, used by Tafti. So, here we have a bar graph. So, you see that we have four groups of two bars. Um, the first observation is that. Uh, Okay, the border around the graph is useless. It's not conveying any information, so we can remove it. Uh, what about uh, these kind of lines? Oh, we can remove them and let the elements be grouped by segments below them. Actually, the information that is encoded by the bar is encoded by the length of the bar. The width of the bar is useless, just a decoration. So we can remove the width of the bar and let just lines. I don't like this. This is too much. Of course, you have to find a good compromise between uh, readability and uh, having too much details that are useless. A special mention uh, deserved, uh, is deserved by the colors that you use in a graph. Uh, in general, uh, the main guideline when you want to use color is uh, get it right in black and white. First of all, uh, if you print your graph on a black and white printer, you should be able to find all the relevant information. So you should use a, a different level of grays or colors that when rendered in black and white uh, render to clearly distinct level of grays. In general, you should use a medium use or, or pastel color uh, because typically bright color, in addition to being disturbing after a while, uh, typically trigger a mechanism uh, when you start looking for some specific information. So bright uh, saturated color should be used to highlight very important information in your graph so that they stand out uh, compared to the rest of the graph. Uh, in terms of the utility uh, of uh, colors and other elements, uh, Tafti used the term uh, chart junk to identify uh, charts or graph that essentially uh, have a lot of useless information. So, uh, the example that also Tafti is using uh, is this uh, diagram uh, reporting the, the price of uh, uh, one carat the flawless diamond uh, from 78 to, to uh, 82. 
Of course, the red line is the information. All the rest is just decoration. Um, this is uh, a, a, a graph by Nigel Holmes. Uh, is uh, a very famous, uh, I would say, artist uh, or designer. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, okay, I don't care being correct. I want to be remembered. So, uh, probably uh, this image will be the only one that you will remember after this lecture. Then I fail <laughs> Hopefully, you won't use these kind of images in your thesis. The third principle is about clarity. Uh, you should use support elements, uh, arrows, uh, axes, uh, and notation uh, to provide uh, guidance in uh, reading your graph. So, for instance, uh, when you use textual elements, uh, and you should uh, uh, this part in your graph, you should use them in a hierarchical form. So, uh, the size of the fonts and the position are an uh, important indicator of the importance. So typically, bigger fonts, fonts that are on the left upper corner, are typically more important than other. Um, all the fonts should be readable, so, so they should be large enough, and uh, horizontal. So anytime you force your reader to bend the head to read your graph, uh, you failed. Um, and in general, uh, the information, the text, uh, should be put very close to the data they refer to. So, uh, the separation between uh, the visual objects and the elements is limited. So, these are the principles. How can we apply them in practice? These are the main attributes, uh, pre attentive attributes that we, we can use uh, to show the elements uh, and to encode uh, the values. Uh, we have orientation, we have shape, length of the lines, uh, curvature of the uh, lines, uh, the width of the lines, uh, the addition of the marks, uh, enclosure of some element inside the uh, border, and the subdis. These are just in terms of form. Then we have attributes of color. So we have the hue, the saturation, and the intensity. It is also called luminance or value, depending on, on the terminology that you use. So you have form, color, and spatial position. Typically, uh, when we talk about spatial position, we have uh, uh, the position with respect to an axis. So you read uh, a value uh, in correspondence to an axis that encode the value, or uh, you use uh, distance between points or lines. Uh, and so this is a relative position between two different values. How can you use uh, this kind of attributes to encode our values? Uh, well, when we have to encode uh, quantitative values, uh, the best choice uh, is uh, the position of points with respect to an axis. There have been several studies uh, where uh, they compared the different ways of encoding the quantitative values into visual attributes, and uh, the most faithful way was representing the points uh, along an axis. Even if the axes are not aligned, if you, you have different axes. The second best option is to use lines, in particular uh, the length of the lines. Then uh, the position of a line with respect to an axis, and much, much farther, the slope of a line. And eventually, if you really, really have to, 
size of the shapes. Uh, typically, when you use an uh, uh, area of a shape uh, as a way of encoding a value, and you compare two different areas, uh, the human perception system typically underestimates uh, the ratio. So in terms of, of perception, using areas uh, is something that typically conveys a wrong information. The position and the length of the lines are the two best options if you want to faithfully represent a quantitative value uh, using visual attributes. Uh, when you need to encode uh, categorical enco uh, values, uh, you can use a lot of other attributes. Most of them. You can use, of course, the position, the size, you can use the color, you can use uh, the shape, uh, you can use uh, a fill pattern, you can use a style of the line. Uh, several elements are useful. Uh, some of them are even able to represent uh, ordinal values, where you, you do not have a real uh, proportion between the elements, but you have an order. Uh, for instance, uh, you have low, medium, high. You don't know if medium is 2 or 10 times larger than low, but you know that medium is higher than low, for sure. So, the most common way of encoding values is to use points. Uh, a Cartesian uh, diagram where you have points and you have uh, two different values and you encode uh, the values as a position with respect to an axis. Probably uh, 70, 90 percent of your diagrams <laughs> look like this. Uh, this kind of representation is very useful, uh, but has some limitation. Of course, you can represent only some kind of information. In addition, uh, when you start having a lot of points, uh, you have a problem that is typically called overblocking. Dots. <coughs> are plotted one over the other. And so you are not able to do the basic uh, step uh, that is discriminate to different points. <coughs> you are not even able to count how many points you have. Yes. So how do you solve the problem of overplotting? Okay, one possibility is uh, you use smaller points. <coughs> that is able to solve something. Uh, of course, they are very small, so you probably should have a lens. Um, another possibility is to use, uh, uh, instead of field shapes, uh, use outline shapes. So if you have circles uh, and inside, you are uh, able to find how many circles you have, and you are able to distinguish uh, areas where you have higher density uh, with, where, uh, with areas where you have a lower density. Uh, another possibility for solving overplotting is to using uh, transparent colors. So uh, you have uh, uh, these dots uh, that are partly transparent and so where you have more dots you have darker uh, colors. Uh, where you have less dots you have uh, lighter colors. Uh, I typically talk about uh, dark uh, because I usually assume that the background of your presentation is white. Uh, do you like white or black background? White. Uh, typically this is a good choice if you are in an environment like this one with a lot of light outside. Uh, black is wonderful if you have uh, an environment with very little light so that you don't see the uh, distinction between the background of your slides and the rest uh, of the environment. 
So size, uh, outline, uh, transparency, and then there is yet another possibility if you want to have uh, a solution to overplotting that is called jittering. So you add some noise in one or, or in two dimensions to the points. So in this specific case, uh, I wanted to show the points corresponding to five different groups. So if I move one point uh, on the horizontal side with a random noise, I'm not altering anything. Still, uh, I can get a better perception of how many points I have in different places. Of course, you can also combine different techniques. Uh, in general, uh, the one I like the best is uh, using transparent color. That is able to solve a lot of problems and uh, works uh, fine when you have uh, a huge number of points. So, points along the scale is the best option. Uh, sometimes uh, you want to use some other technique, uh, for instance, uh, using uh, bars. Uh, bars encode a specific number using the length of the bar. So that measure is the number that encodes the value that you want to represent. Of course, you uh, report also a scale so you can uh, read the, the real value. But anyway, you are able to compare uh, the relative size of the uh, values. The fact that you encode the number into the length means that bars should be zero based. So this is a, a report from the Ministry of Finance in Italy, uh, eight, ten years ago. Uh, the numbers here are the number of uh, students uh, per teacher on average. Uh, in this graph we have uh, two main problems. One is uh, proportionality. So if you compare uh, the 8 of this bar with the 8 uh, of the bar on the left hand side, uh, with the value that they represent, uh, we, you have a life factor of 2.2. So this is exaggerating the difference between uh, the different values. The reason is obvious. The bars were cut at a certain uh, 8, and so only the uh, upper part of the bar is reported. But here we have another issue that is not concerning proportionality but is concerning clarity. We are missing the vertical axis, so it is more difficult to read. You need to read the numbers on the bars. And of course, the labels are not a horizontal. Of course, when you use this kind of graph, it's very difficult to put the label horizontal, otherwise, they overlap one over the other. So, first of all, uh, the same uh, diagram uh, using a zero-based axis looks like this. So you see there are differences, but they are not so high as in the previous diagram. Still, we have these uh, uh, banded uh, labels that typically can be sold using a set of horizontal bars. Anytime you have long labels in a bar graph, the solution is to use horizontal bars. Because you can uh, squeeze a little bit the diagram and have as much room as you want for your uh, labels. So if you compare this graph with uh, this one, you see that they look completely different, apart from the color. Uh, they represent the same data, but they are completely different. So here you can read the labels, you have an axis, um, and the bars are not lying to you. Another alternative to, using, uh, to use uh, uh, bars is to use what is called a uh, dot plot. 
The difference uh, here is that uh, uh, dots uh, encode the value only relative to an axis. So while for bars it is mandatory to use a zero-based scale, in this case uh, you are not forced to use a zero-based scale, you can use uh, any scale you like. So you can emphasize as much as you want the differences uh, without line. Uh, I, I put this lines here to allow uh, easier reading uh, because when you have uh, when you are getting the bottom it's more difficult to see that for instance a media is 13 but in this case you are not conveying a wrong information you are not lying because you read the value on the scale this is a, a nice uh, uh, representation, it is a good alternative to use uh, uh, bars. Unless you have a lot of time, sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, but in this case, we don't have a uh, life factor error? Or? Uh, you don't have life factor because uh, you read uh, this number on the axis. Ah, okay. Why? In the previous case, uh, you read the value in terms of length of the bar. Ah, okay. It is, you are encoding the, the value in different ways. Mm -hmm. One is length and the other is position relative to an axis. Yes, if you cut the bars and you keep uh, the axis, you probably solve something, but here uh, the bars are, are really visible. So having the, the bars cut uh, typically conveys a uh, wrong information. Uh, maybe you noticed that uh, I used only two-dimensional graphs. My recommendation is never, ever, ever use 3D graphs. Uh, I selected a, an ugly one on purpose and uh, just to highlight uh, the typical uh, limitation of this kind of diagram. Uh, typically, the proportionality is affected by the perspective. So you typically expect uh, bars in the uh, back to be shorter because of perspective. This is not a perspective, it's a sonometry, so they are not uh, shorter. Um, you have uh, uh, a lot of grid lines that typically distract, uh, but they are the only way to allow reading the values. Um, you have vertical axis uh, as vertical text, uh, it's uh, usual. Um, you have ears that go in the opposite direction as expected. You typically expect uh, ears to grow, usually from left to right, uh, but at least uh, from uh, front to back. Well, here, uh, recent here, are on the front. 